Uh, Jack Nichols, BBC Formula One commentator, joins us on the line. Good morning, Jack. How are things? Morning. All good, thank you. Keeping well. Are you as excited about this season as, as the rest of us? I mean, Max Verstappen's win last year has led us to believe that, that he's, he's on the way up. Lewis Hamilton, of course, still searching for that eighth world title. Is it going to be a procession for Max this year or can you see a challenger? I think it's it's difficult to know because it's the longest Formula One season in history, 23 races from now until the end of November. And although we've just had three days of preseason testing here in Bahrain and it looks like Red Bull are strong, you never know what's going to happen over the course of the year because Ferrari started the season last year strongest and Red Bull went on to dominate. So I think that it is ominous looking for for Verstappen or for those who maybe don't want Verstappen to win um, but I think they're going to be the the strongest out the blocks but we've got a long way to go they've made improvements to their car as well Red Bull this this Honda engine everyone knows is very very strong it, it, does that make it a little bit more ominous for for opposing teams because you mentioned the testing Red Bull have been oozing confidence in testing it has to be said yeah and I think a lot of the other teams are sort of playing their chances down a little. But that is kind of how Red Bull roll, isn't it? You know, they're a very aggressive kind of brand and team. And they're always saying, yeah, we're the best. And Verstappen as well is not exactly a a guy lacking in confidence, should we say. Whereas, you know, the Ferraris and the Mercedes of this world tend to be a little bit more, oh, you know, we'll see what happens. Can't read too much into testing. So I think that Red Bull have made improvements. Mercedes have made a good amount of improvement, but they were so far off last year that they've got so far to catch up you know so as even though they've done a good job and uh and, and have closed the gap a little we'll we'll have to wait and see exactly how close they are such a disappointing year for for mercedes and, and hamilton in particular last season jack sixth in the driver standings further back than i'm sure even he would have would have expected some of the comments that, that i'm hearing from toto wolf uh, in the last couple of weeks have been quite surprising he said uh, at the launch of their car so we have to have a car capable of challenging for the championship eventually and George Russell as well used the word eventually twice in one answer to press conference. This word eventually, does it strike you as a bit of almost ex- accepting that they're not quite at the level of Red Bull this year and they're looking even further down the line? I, 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 it's, it's impossible to know what eventually means, isn't it? I think that's the thing. Like Maybe they mean halfway through the season yeah. is eventually. And in which case, if they can stay close to Red Bull for the first half of the year then eventually they can start to mount a title challenge. But they may mean eventually means 2026 when there's a whole new load of rule changes. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens there, especially because, you know, Hamilton is getting towards the end of his career and everyone's always like, oh, when's he going to retire? When's he going to retire? And he says he's not going to and he's going to do a few more years. But as you say, sixth in the championship last year. I mean, I guess for Hamilton, if he's sixth or third or second it kind of doesn't really make any difference mm-hmm. you know because he's here for the for the championships and i don't think he'll be sixth in the standings this year i think they'll be a little better than that mercedes but will they be able to have him fight for a championship which would be his eighth championship which is kind of the the record he's aiming for no one's won eight before hamilton and schumacher are, are tied on seven so it's very strange how um yeah, sort of downbeat, I suppose, Mercedes are. But maybe they're just trying to keep expectations in check. Temper them a bit. Yeah, possibly. It could be a, it yeah. could be a nice uh, way to approach it. But the, it, Hamilton's been in the, the headlines as well in the off-season. We've had all this discussion around freedom of speech. Um, fairly controversial winter. The F- FIA president, Mohammed Ben Suleyem, uh, fairly upset the drivers, it has to be said. Uh, apparent ban on free speech. He said that he then backtracked and then taking a back seat from, from day-to-day running of F1, Lewis Hamilton came out and said, I'm going to continue to say exactly what I want. Has this been a, been a distraction that Formula 1 didn't need in the off-season? Um, I think, I think the, the lack of... Um, the, the sort of weird direction that the FIA president took in those various scenarios was very strange. I don't think it's really become too much of a distraction for the, for the sport, really, because I think now, especially now that as you say, Mohammed bin Salim has decided to step back from the sort of day-to-day running of Formula One. I think that'll quieten down a little bit. But it was all very odd, all of that stuff, especially because, I mean, Hamilton has been in uh, not exactly hot water with the FI over the last few years, but, you know, he went and wore um, a T-shirt on uh, the podium. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it said um, 
you know, arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor was, you know, all his T-shirt said and on the podium. And so that, you know, talking about quite emotive subjects. And I think the FIA are always keen to um, suggest that sport and politics can be separated, not in a dissimilar way. You know, Formula One races in Qatar and Saudi Arabia and here in Bahrain, you know, countries that maybe don't necessarily have a a great reputation throughout the world but and we and we saw the FIA well they kind of behave in the way that that FIFA do right with Qatar and the World Cup there where it's oh we're separating sport and politics and um Harry Kane can't wear, wear the rainbow armband and you know all those sorts of things is an attempt from you know the governing bodies to to separate the location they're in and the political uh consequences of that from what from the drivers and, and the sport ultimately is kind of their goal. Jack, do you watch Drive Survive or is it too low brow for somebody who's uh, involved in the sport as you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I, 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 uh, yeah, I, I have to watch them because I do some of the commentary for it. So yeah. some of those shouting guys going, oh, Hamilton, blah, blah, that's me. So, One of the yeah, stars of the it. show. Okay. So, uh, well, well, yeah, well, not quite. <laughs> are they, um, are you doing those in post or are they, is, um, am I asking too much here? <laughs> no, it's a it's it's a mixture, honestly, because okay. uh, I I do the commentary for the BBC, but Drive to Survive aren't then allowed to use the the rights of the BBC commentary, so I then have to go in and say exactly what I said before. Okay, so, <laughs> rinse, rinse it's, it's quite funny. is it tough to manufacture excitement? You know, when you're when it's already happened, I guess. The thing is, I think I always think I've done an all right job, and then I watch them back, and it's like, oh, that's terrible. Terrible stuff. And, it's good to know, uh, we're, you know, good to know in- we're all in the same boat on that one, Jack. That's a- <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And the internet is full of being like, oh, this fake commentary is terrible. So, yeah, it is tough to do. And I don't know why, because you say exactly the same thing in exactly the same tone, but you're just lacking a little bit of something i don't know you know yeah it happens but some of more... the a lot of the commentary in it is 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 real from the from the sky guys and stuff so yeah. i just there to sort of fill in the gaps a little it happens more we're revealing too much behind the curtain here of course but it happens more in this industry than uh, that i think people are aware of um yeah has it had a so i'm uh dri- i watch drive survive religiously we've been chatting about it earlier on i love it I don't really watch F1 races because uh, they just don't fall at a good time for me. Uh, and there might be a follow-on question from that in a second. But has it had like a bleed of audience from, from Drive Survive to those interested in watching around it and watching races from, from what you can see? Yeah, absolutely huge. The, the, the Drive to Survive impact, especially in America, has been, has been massive. And I think, but there is a, there is a sort of, in, I'm hearing sort of, very anecdotal stories from people now where it's like if they've watched drive to survive got into formula one they then don't watch drive to survive the next year because they know what happened the first year they watched drive to survive it was all a big you know discovery who's this what's this (laughs) then you get into the to the sport watch it for a season you don't need to watch the next season of drive to survive because you watched the last season which is quite interesting and apparently there's a um, apparently some of the drivers are being asked, you know, oh, when are you filming the next series of Drive to Survive? And they're like, well, no, 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 it's, it's a racing, it's a racing right. championship. Like, we race, that's real. What, uh, we, we were uh, chatting about it yesterday in advance of the show, just about, like, so that point that, you know, it's very much my experience, but I do find it hard to sit down and commit the time to watch it at the weekend with everything else going on. It was, is there any argument for putting, um, moving it to a week day or week night has that ever been discussed or is that an absolutely ludicrous notion I, I i don't think it is a ludicrous notion it's never been seriously discussed from from what i can tell nascar in america i think do some weeknight races they do it quite a lot actually and um there's there was but only because of covid but a, a championship called formula e an electric racing championship did a few sort of evening races but it's an interesting theory. I think that I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know what to say about that because I know, it's, it's a really a, interesting a thought. And and when you when you think look at how, um, as you say, congested like sports weekend schedules. Are. I mean, we have it right because we are. My commentary goes on five live, but mm. there's always a two o'clock Premier League kickoff or a four o'clock Premier League kickoff. So most of the time, until you get into the proper summer, um, we're on. You know. Five Sports Extra or the BBC website or whatever, because football obviously takes priority for for a lot of people. So it's a it's it's an interesting thought um, and one I've not really thought of before. It's a good job. Yeah, Jack. Uh, 
one of the the, the teams in testing that is that have really excited a lot of people have been have been Aston Martin. I like many others. I'm a big fan of, of Fernando Alonso and that decision to leave Alpine last year. Everyone was thinking, well, what's he doing? But turns out, I mean, if you look at the Aston Martin car in testing, it's a beast. And um, I guess the question is, can it challenge Mercedes? Like, is this a car that it could be pushing for for second in the constructors' championship, or, or am I getting ahead of myself? I, I, it, the I think everybody, from what it looked like in testing, maybe. It looked as though Red Bull and Ferrari are probably the two front runners, mm. but then maybe Aston Martin are a third quickest. But I think everybody's a little reluctant to really commit to that for the same reason that that you are, because it's a it's still well, it's a team that were the Jordan team and then Force India, and they're kind of they've had a load of uh, investment from billionaire team owner Lawrence Stroll, and they're making the investment and they're trying to push towards the front, but they're still you know, it feels like they should still be quite a few years away from that. But I think everybody wants them to to get towards the front. And then Fernando Alonso back at the front would be a great story. Mm. So I think everybody, I, I, almost everybody in the paddock would really like that to be a case with Alonso on the podium and fighting for wins for Aston Martin. I mean, that's a really cool story, but everyone's just a little bit, there must be something that doesn't add up because Fernando Alonso spent his whole career making the wrong decisions of which team to join. So, and Aston Martin have spent their whole time sort of in the midfield. So to think that Aston Martin are going to be at the front with Alonso, who's made the correct career decision for once, it's like, it's too good to be true Mm. almost, you know? So uh, I think there's a little bit of skepticism about it still. And he hasn't won a race, I I think since 2013. So that'll be something that'll be nice to, to see this, this season for sure. You mentioned Ferrari there. Um, and, and Stephen Aiden were talking about it earlier. They've replaced their team principal, of course. Matteo Benotto is out. Fred Vasseur is in. Uh, loads of, of race strategy errors, uh, unforced race strategy errors last season that, that kind of overshadowed Ferrari's uh, campaign. How do you think they can they can fare this year? Have they, have they possibly stamped out all of those mistakes, do you reckon? Well, I think it'll take a bit of time. But Fred Vasseur, as you say, has come in from the Alfa Romeo team. He's the first outside hire for a Ferrari team principal for 30 years. The last one was Jean Todd in 1993. Ever since then, Ferrari have promoted from within. And you kind of get the feeling that just perpetuates or continues the culture within the team. And so Fred Vasseur has come in and he's instantly moved the the head of strategy back to Marinello. So he's not coming to the track anymore. That'll be a sort of change in the strategy plan, which was as you say, in, incredibly needed after after last season. So it looks as though they're taking the, the right steps, at least. And they are, you know, for all of the negativity around last season, it was the most competitive they've been for a long time. So they are moving in the general right direction. And I think Vasseur is a really interesting appointment you know he's an he's a no-nonsense Frenchman again the first Frenchman or the first non-Italian to be in charge of that team since Jean Todd Mm -hmm. when he left in 2006 or 7 I think it was I think it was 2006 so things are changing at Ferrari and I think that can only be a good thing and I think they realized it's it's an absolutely necessary thing Uh, finally Jack just to get your your prediction this is always the awkward and tough part uh, predictions for the season in terms of constructors championship drivers championship and maybe the the rookie that's going to stand out as well I'm looking at the so we've got Logan Sargent in at Williams the first American driver in uh, in almost 10 years in Formula 1 Nick DeVries is in with Alfa Torre and uh, Oscar Piastri with uh, with McLaren so who's your pick for constructors championship drivers championship and, and maybe rookie of the year I mean, I, don't, I uh, like uh, every part of me not wants to not say Max Verstappen and Red Bull for the for the teams and the and the drivers. I think that, but I couldn't pick. I, I couldn't pick who would beat them. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it could be Ferrari. I think they could have a shot if Mercedes can get on top of their car. You know, in, in the first quarter of the year, maybe they could have a shot. But I, I'd be too scared to pick one of those over Verstappen you know uh and as for the rookie I think Oscar Piastri is a is a driver that everybody's really excited about he's won everything he's raced in on his way up the junior formula up against Lando Norris at McLaren is going to be a really really tough ask for him that's a bit of a baptism of fire but Mm -hmm. we see it with the best when Lewis Hamilton came in in 2007 and immediately matched Fernando Alonso that's when you know that these kids have got it, so I'm excited to see what the Australian Oscar Piastri can do at McLaren. 
And we look forward to you following your coverage and uh, listening to you on Drive to Survive. Jack Nichols of the BBC, <laughs> thanks a million. No worries, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, really good stuff there. Uh,